Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Yeah, uh, we have just uh, discussed the relevance of ecological anthropology and uh, we'll try to broaden it. why is uh, ecological anthropology an emerging and which perhaps is seen to be pretty much important in trying to understand how the relations between human and nature has coexist and in trying to understand the interrelations between uh, human and nature. Now, as we uh, had uh, looked at and discussed how Julian Stewart has come up with a different concepts in trying to make sense and understand uh, the various interrelations and uh, oh, beginning from the 1960s, there has been and uh, urging increase uh, in terms of the needs uh, in order to locate the various uh, changing trends and uh, inter in interactions which uh, exist between human and nature or human the ecosystem. Now, uh, moving on uh, next to what we had uh, seen and discussed from Julian Stewart's. Uh, uh, we will try to pick and discuss some of the anthropologists in this particular field and uh, Marvin Harris is one of them and uh, Marvin no doubt uh, has contributed immensely in the field of uh, ecological anthropology and he has conceptualized uh, a term called cultural materialism and uh, he gave a lot of emphasis on the material aspects. Uh, it, is, it is not just the ideas which is important in trying to understand uh, relations be between human and nature or human ecosystem. So, what uh, Mervyn Harris tries to look and focus is uh, this particular school of thought in which uh, Mervyn Harris belongs to. Uh, tends to you know like uh, espouse uh, the kind of uh, relations that technology and economic features has uh, a far reaching impact or in a sense uh, have a sort of uh, relationship with the features of a society or in shaping what uh, society is. Now, these are some of the kind of characteristics which uh, Harris also focus on and he strongly give uh, sort of a priority to the concepts of infrastructure over structure and superstructure. Now, when we talk about structure, it is more to do with the materialistic aspect and when we talk about superstructure, it is more of the ideas which is something uh, non-physical. Now, uh, the infrastructure as I said is sort of uh, a mode of production and uh, there is an interrelationship between this mode of production, the kind of population which inhabit a particular habitat and also the kind of the mating patterns. Now, structure ideally refers to uh, more of a domestic and the political economic aspect and superstructure consists of more of a, you know a leisure if not a recreational kind of productions services. Now, in this context Harris 
main purpose was to show or to demonstrate the kind of adaptive materialistic rationality of old uh, cultural uh, features which is pretty much uh, embedded in that particular environment. Now, in essence we can see that the adaptive mechanism which is primarily based on this materialist aspect is to be seen in almost every cultural group while they are uh, sort of making sense or adapting with the environment which they inhabit. Now, secondly, uh, of course, the third one. Uh, now, uh, Roy Rappaport is also contributing immensely in the uh, field of this ecological anthrop uh, anthropology, and uh, his work, some of the notable works which he uh, has published. Uh, ritual meaning and ecology or ecology meaning and uh, religion. How he tries to uh, interpret and relate uh, or sort of tries to critically understand ecology and religion. How people make sense of their ecology through the use of religion such as rituals, ceremonies and so on and so forth. And also uh, his pr uh, prior work on peaks for the ancestor was uh, has contributed immensely despite so much of criticism. Now, what, what, what are the kind of uh, contributions Roy Rappaport has made? He in fact uh, has uh, brought a new innings in terms of trying to understand uh, ecology from the structural and functionalist perspective. He tries to bring in structuralism and functionalism together in order to make sense or understand ecology. And in this, he conceptualized a term called uh, a paradigm or rather a way of looking uh, ecology from the new functionalist perspective, which I will uh, broadly uh, give a conceptual clarifications in the later slides. Now, using this new functionalism approach, he tends to bring in a new ideas or a new perspective in trying to locate and understand uh, human and ecology. And Rappaport tends to see culture as something which is uh, sort of a function uh, of the ecosystem and also he strongly focuses on trying to understand the caring capacity and which of course uh, needs to be understood in the context of energy expenditure which uh, perhaps is precisely the central themes in Rappaport studies and uh, he has conducted uh, quite an extensive study in New Guinea and uh, among the Sembaga tribe. Now, uh, we would be uh, elaborating that in a later discussion. Now, Rappaport in a sense uh, tries to you know like uh, look at uh, make a systematic study of uh, how ritual, religion and ecology are interrelated and are to be seen as something which is synchronic, which is uh, parallel and also as something which is functionalist. And uh, these sort of characteristics of a society which he studied among the Sembaga tribes contributed immensely in trying to the making sense of the ecology which they have inhabited. And as a result of this scientific revolution, functionalism in anthropology uh, has taken a, a, a new level, in a sense, a new ecology, and which perhaps is uh, one of the main contributions of Rappaport. Now, as I said, uh, what uh, Rappaport has come with a new paradigm by uh, employing the terminology called new functionalism. 
Now, what is new functionality? Now, the term sort of uh, uh, was revised or reused uh, beginning from the 1960s and which primarily focus on trying to uh, sort of bring forth uh, the structural and functionalist perspective and neo functionalism in a sense uh, tends to you know explicitly uh, uh, un trying to make sense of understand the system level interactions and uh, especially the uh, kind of negative feedback which is uh, of immense importance to techno environmental forces. Now, this sort of interplay which is seen in the context of environment ecology and population is perhaps uh, what he intends to see from the neo functionalist approach. Now, within this neo functionalism, culture in a sense is reduced to sort of uh, an adaptive mechanism or an adaptation and the kind of uh, behavior, the functional behaviors of those populations are homeostatic and uh, deviation which is counteracting and serving to maintain the systems at large. Now, neo functional uh, also tends to measure uh, sort of the tangible currencies such as the population density and also that relates to the fitness which is uh, primarily focused uh, as in the evolutionary biology. Now, why is uh, population given importance in this new functional uh, perspective? Now, the more a population increases or the density of the population it tends to have uh, an implications or influences on the natural surroundings and obviously, it will put more pressure on the natural resources. Therefore, uh, Rappaport also give uh, an understanding of the carrying capacity of a particular environment of how the human populations uh, in a sense make a subsistence. Uh, in, in, in terms of the means of livelihood. Now, uh, Moran has uh, again uh, given the, an explanation of what the carrying capacity is where I quote uh, what Moran says is carrying capacity is the number of individuals that habitat can support that is the natural resources in a particular environment which can in essence uh, support or can uh, sort of uh, supply the demands of the population. And this particular idea of Marant is related to the kind of population pressure which in a sense can be referred to the demands of a population on the resources of uh, that particular ecosystem. Now, when we talk about population, uh, let us try to refresh our mind by bringing in uh, Malthus uh, ideas or essays on population, wherein he tends to not sort of uh, warn us that if a population increases uh, in, a, in an uncontrolled manner, it in a way will have a far reaching impact on the uh, habitat. Now, uh, moving on to what uh, Moran has in essence tries to uh, explicitly explain here is that if uh, the kind of technology which a particular group engages shift uh, that is from more of a simple to or a complex or maybe using a simple tools like X and then uh, certain other simple tools. And if people move on to much more of a modernized or a civilized so called kind of 
uh, technology like uh, tractors and so on and so forth, it will definitely hamper or if not affect the carrying capacity. So, in essence the evolution of technology has uh, directly uh, impacted on the carrying capacity, it will definitely change. Now, one uh, particular example uh, of the applications of this carrying capacity within the discipline of this ecological anthropology is uh, vividly explained by Rappaport study among the Sambaga Maring in the New Guinea, which I will uh, <coughs> elaborately give uh, a picture in the later discussion. Now, uh, what is this synchronic study then, uh, which uh, Rappaport has talked about? Now, in this, it is more or less uh, based on a short term investigation rather than a longitudinal kind of study. Remember, uh, when a field work is being carried out on a particular cultural group or a society, anthropologists usually involve maybe as a participant observation by engaging an ethnographic study or periodically maybe for a period of like few months or maybe a year and then few years. Now, in this synchronic study, it is more on a short term investigations that occur at a particular point of time and does not really take into account the historical processes. Now, the validity or rationality of uh, an empirical research again is normally uh, when a society or a cultural group is being studied, uh, we tend to look at the social and economic history of that particular group. But over here, it is more of uh, sort of I would not say a journalistic kind of uh, investigation, but it is a very brief kind of uh, field work which is being uh, conducted in this uh, what, what Rappaport has uh, mentioned about in this synchronic study. Now, uh, moving on the other anthropologist called Harold Kunklind. Now, Kunklind's uh, contribution is pretty much uh, he is sort of a pioneer in the field of studying the agriculture in traditional societies and his main contribution is uh, on the method or the kind of uh, socio-cultural uh, relationship which is uh, seen in the context of slush and barn cultivation. And Kunklind is uh, pretty much uh, well known uh, in the field of anthropology for his contributions of this slush and burn cultivation, which is also known as sifting cultivation and also mostly uh, known as zooming practices. Now, depending on the kind of region and geographical area, there has been a different names given. And in the areas like Southeast Asia, it is also known as Sweden, Sweden agriculture. Now, over here, what is the primary focus? It tends to look at the kind of uh, the availability of land and also the kind of populations which in a sense inhabit and practices this agriculture uh, system. Now, uh, under this condition, uh, as there is uh, an abundance of availability of land and if a population is sparsely populated, it will have uh, less environmental effect or there will be less destructions of the environment. Now, for, for those who are not very uh, uh, familiar and then new to the practices of this cultivation, uh, usually uh, a particular community if not a family tends to locate uh, a patch of land and 
clear those forest and usually engage in burning so that the nutrients and fertility of the soil is retained. And after a few years of uh, cultivating that particular area, they move on to a different patch of land by keeping that area to remain fallow so that it regenerate and revitalize the soil nutrients. So, it is sort of like a cultivation which is being shift from one place to another. Now, uh, the recent uh, research on the shifting cultivation, uh, what they have found out is due to the increase in population, uh, there is an increasing demand of availability of land and people tends to engage more permanently rather than uh, leaving that area for fallow. So, which means rather than what the traditional practice of shifting cultivation, now it becomes more of a permanent cultivation. Now, in the process, it tends to sort of uh, to be seen as environmentally destructive, because owing to the kind of uh, practices which involve like felling down of trees and then burning them, so on and so forth. Now, many of the environmentalists, if not the scientific community, tends to see these practices as something which is posing a threat to the environment. And also from the economic perspective, if you look at, it is not really uh, the kind of output which, which is which is being received is not really benefiting, if not from the market uh, orientation, it is not really beneficial. Now, uh, Netting father gives an explanation that uh, the wide and detailed knowledge of plant and animal species, the climate, the topography and soils are more or less based on the ethno scientific repertoire of indigenous food producers. Now, again, this indigenous knowledge or the ethno scientific which a particular community possess in a way is based on the idea of subsistence rather than accumulation or profit. Now, therefore, uh, not just the agriculture practices, but they also do have uh, uh, an abundant knowledge in terms of managing the plants, animals and different uh, topographical and uh, the climatic change. Now, netting also uh, further uh, basing on Kung Lin's understanding of slus and bun uh, cultivation, he tends to set the standards of these uh, ecological descriptions with uh, a clear uh, explanation of the cartography of land use and village boundaries. Now, this sort of ecological description again is important because uh, usually people tends to uh, dwell in a place where they can uh, flourish in terms of these agriculture practices. Now, Kung Lin's focus was more on integrating this ethnoecology and cultural ecology. Remember, this, uh, he tends to you know club together and try to see the relationship between this ethnoecology and cultural ecology of the agro system or the agro ecosystem uh, of the community called the Hanuna and Ifugao in the Philippines. Now, he conducted an extensive study in the in the in Philippines in the rural areas or traditional practices of those communities in Philippines. Now, in that study, he tends to see the kind of relationship between uh, the ecology and the cultural practices of those people in trying to make sense of the uh, agro ecosystems. Now, another anthropologist who is uh, has contributed immensely in the field of 
uh, ecological anthropology again is uh, Roy Elland. Roy Elland is uh, more known for his uh, extensive research on the kind of traditional ecological knowledge and local knowledge of a particular community. Now, Allen's main focus was in his studies on the ecology of subsistence behavior, how a particular community tends to involve or try to make sense of their ecology and they tends to uh, sort of follow these tra um, traditions or practices of subsistence. And he also focuses on the ethnobiology classification and the social organization of trade. And his work uh, was mainly confined in the West Java among the Nualu community. And through his work, he comes to develop uh, the kind of increasing understanding uh, of the concepts which are pretty much uh, widely used by the indigenous peoples and their understanding of the environment. So, in a sense that sort of uh, relationship between the, the ecology and uh, the indigenous peoples were pretty much being uh, emphasized by Roy Allen. Now, Allen has uh, uh, quite a, a number of uh, publications and a few of his publications here are the Nuala Settlement and Ecology, which was published way back in 1981 and also Environment Subsistence and System, the Ecology of Small Scale Social Formations, which was published in 1982 and Social and Ecological Systems and uh, Malinowski Between Worlds, that is uh, way back in 1989. Now, in the entire throughout of his uh, research, he tends to see the duality between environment uh, subsistence and the social system of uh, those indigenous peoples. How they tend to make sense of their environment and the kind of ecological knowledge which they have possessed in a sense were to be seen from a subsistence agricultural practices. Now, as I had uh, talked about uh, the cultural core which was mentioned by Julian Stewart, here he defined this what is cultural core then. Now, Julian, Julian Stewart uh, defined give a conceptual definition of cultural core as something which is the features of a particular society that are closely related to subsistence activities and economic arrangements. So, there are different uh, economic arrangements in different societies in different period of time. Now, it will be difficult to see the kind of these subsistence activities and economic arrangement from a modernist if not a capitalist uh, economic perspective. Now, ideally this cultural core is also pretty much uh, ex expressive in the line of how a particular community which inhabit a particular environment makes sense or make full use of the existing available natural resources in order to meet their needs. And perhaps not something they do not believe in the idea of surplus and uh, they usually engage in uh, agriculture practices which in a sense uh, fulfill their basic requirements or basic needs. And furthermore, this uh, cultural core also includes the political, religious and social patterns that are sort of interrelated to that is or in relationship with and such arrangements. Now, in a sense you can say that cultural core is also a part of that adaptation to a specific or particular environment. Now, ethnobotany is also part of the understanding 
of a particular community in which the emergence of the plants, the species in their uh, sort of habitat area. Now, ethnobotany again is an ethnoscientific study of relationship between human beings and the plant life. Now, uh, way back in the 1960s, these ethnobotanical units were used in ecological comparisons. Now, why is this ethnobotany important? Now, if you look at some of the indigenous communities, they do make sense and understand the potentials and the intrinsic value of plants. Now, uh, before this modern medical system was introduced, many of these indigenous peoples rely on these uh, plants as medicines or medicinal plants. And this extensive or vast knowledge which they have on these plants have in a sense contributed to their well-being. And even till today, this ethnobotany is pretty much revert. Now, there are different functions of how uh, these things are being carried on and uh, there are two ways of looking at one is the manifest function and one is the latest fun latent function. Now, a latent function of uh, a particular community behavior is not something which is explicitly stated or recognized or which is uh, perhaps intended by the people involved in it, thus they are identified by the observers, which is not simply uh, explicitly shown or expressed. Rather, latent functions are more or less uh, associated with the ethic and the operational models. For example, uh, if you see uh, Rappaport's works on pigs and for the ancestor, uh, which is more of the ritual uh, in the ecology of New Guinea people. The latent functions in that particular community is uh, the sacrifice of too many pigs, that is slaughtering of uh, a number of animals. While its manifest, uh, manifest function in that particular sacrifice of is the sacrifice to pigs to the ancestor. Now, what is the sort of hidden meaning, if not the idea which is embedded in this sacrifice of the pig? Now, there can be two levels of function, that is the latent and the manifest function. The manifest function can be the kind of sacrifice which is being uh, done to the, in reverence to their ancestor. Whereas, the latent can be sort of the number of pigs which are being slaughtered in that particular ritual. Now, these are to be uh, sort of uh, categorically understood uh, and in manifest function, uh, it sort of uh, explicitly stated or which is much more uh, evident and apparent and uh, which is understood by the participant in the relevant action. Now, in latent function, it requires an observer to uh, sort of uh, look at uh, the in-depth meaning which is being attached to it rather than the uh, outside if not uh, the vivid expression of that particular sacrifices. Now, for example, in a rain dance, the manifest function could be uh, to produce rain and this outcome usually is intended and desired by people participating in the ritual and this could be defined as emic and cognized models. Now, this is the emic expression and uh, whereas, Latin is more of an ethic. Now, if you look at the latent function uh, by giving an example of this rain dance, again the, this particular outcome might have a different explanation and a different intention of trying to explain 
how people are being uh, participating in that particular ritual and uh, the desire to receive abundant rain. Now, if you look at the historical ecology, uh, historical ecology tends to you know uh, make sense or understand the how culture and environment mutually influence each other over a period of time, maybe it can be generations and sort of uh, a continuous uh, which has been uh, prevalent in the past years. And these studies have sort of uh, diachronic dimensions and what are these diachronic dimensions and why is it important to sort of historically understand uh, the kind of uh, relations which exist between culture and environment and how these two are mutually influencing each other. Now, historical ecology again is a holistic and affirms that uh, life is not independent from culture. So, even if a community lives in isolations uh, from different societies, they do have uh, a kind of practices which is broadly understand as culture and this culture again is an ecological perspective which in a sense adhere to the idea of uh, the relationship between a human population and its physical environment and this has to be understood and examined holistically rather than uh, deterministically. Now, as we had discussed in the uh, previous lectures on how human ecology is to be seen from uh, environmental determinism and environmental possibilism. Now, environment usually uh, do not determine the behavior of a particular community and it can be uh, therefore, it is important to see from much more of a holistic approach. There can be no single uh, explanation. It, it, it is not suffice to see from a uh, unidimensional approach, rather it has to be seen from a multidimensional or a holistic approach. Now, for example, the landscape can be explained or understood uh, historically in a different way. Now, what is this landscape again? Landscape, if we try to inject the idea of culture, it can be seen as a cultural landscape. Now, a cultural landscape again can be not necessarily the physical aspect, but it can be also more of ideational, it can be imaginary. The kind of social memory a part particular community has attached to that particular landscape has also to be captured if it has to be seen uh, in a more holistic way. Now, why is landscape uh, to be understood or explained historically? Because historical ecology again attempts to study land as an artifact of human activity. What is this artifact? Usually, uh, there are different kinds of imprints or meanings which are being attributed to uh, the natural surroundings or ecosystem. For instance, a river can be sacred to a particular community or maybe a stone uh, can be uh, a stone which is usually an artifact can have certain kind of connections and interrelations between the human and that particular object. Therefore, landscape uh, has to be sort of contextualized or understood from the perspective of historical ecology. Now, uh, if you look at many uh, the indigenous communities or those who tends to sort of express their ethnic identity to a particular landscape, they do have these stories of uh, their attachment and the kind of value which they attach to for instance the sacred forest or a sacred grove. Now, a sacred grove uh, in the indigenous communities 
they tend to preserve that particular forest because they feel that uh, the spirits of their ancestors dwells or maybe before they depart from this uh, uh, mundane world they tend to dwell in that place therefore this spirit which is in the existence of, of that particular environment is so sacred to that community. Now therefore a landscape can have a multi-faceted meanings and it has to be understood from uh, a multi-dimensional perspective. Now the sum of the methodology which is uh, widely used in the field of uh, ecological anthropology since its development. Now, uh, the cultural eco in cultural ecology, one of the methodology which is popularly being used uh, beginning from 1950s and early 60s involve the uh, prior identification of the kind of technology which is being employed by populations in the use of environmental resources. Now again why is technology important? Now if you look at the kind of uh, different levels of society or how the civilization has uh, sort of an impinging on human societies, technology in a sense has uh, explicitly plays a very important role in trying to uh, make sense of the environment by human populations. Now this is one of the uh, first methodology which was uh, being posited and used by in the, the cultural ecology. And the second is the patterns of uh, behavior which is relevant to the use of that particular technology. And lastly this the extent to which these behaviors affect other cultural characteristics is again examined and understood. Now what are the patterns of this behavior which are relevant to the use of technology? Now as I had discussed previously uh, with the changes in this technology, as technology becomes finer and more sort of modernized, a uh, sort of behavior uh, also changes and maybe a lifestyle uh, or modes of production or our relationship with the environment has changes uh, bit by bit and then uh, sometime it can be more of a drastical change. Now let us uh, give an example uh, look at the works of Marvin Harris uh, what are the kind of methodology which he has employed in trying to develop uh, the f in the field of this ecology uh, in which was more or less used in the 1960s. Now as we had discussed Harris cultural materialism, the method uh, or the concepts which he used incorporates the ecological uh, explanation and advances a more explicit and systematic scientific research strategy. Now, he tries to you know bring in this materialist, materialist aspect that is the modes of production, how humans engages in the sort of trying to uh, the means of livelihood. Now this concept of adaptation which was used by Harris mainly tries to have uh, an explanatory mechanism and uh, his research uh, also tries to uh, focus uh, on the extensive uh, literary research in comparison uh, and uh, in one of his work uh, the cultural ecology of India's sacred cattle. Again here we tend to look at why a particular community for uh, particular community an animal is considered to be sacred and uh, depending on that uh, there is a sort of a behavior which is being attributed 
to the relationship with that environment. And uh, thirdly, Rappaport and Vadia also has contributed significantly to the applications of new methodologies in 1960s and both of them has focused upon the ecosystem approach uh, in trying to understand the functioning and the flow of energy. And this ecosystem uh, approach uh, for quite some time remained popular among the ecological anthropologists in the 60s and 70s. And uh, ethnoecology was also relevant uh, for quite some time or few decades. And this ethnoecology methodology falls within the cognitive anthropology. It is more to do with the kind of knowledge or ideas which a particular community has uh, learned if not uh, embedded within them. Now, let us look at the ecosystem based uh, model of human ecology. Now, uh, there is this American anthropologist by the name called Andrew Wadia and Roy Rappaport, which suggested that instead of studying uh, simply how culture are adapted to the environment attention uh, should rather be focused on the relationship of uh, specific human populations to the specific ecosystem. That is, it is not just something uh, where a culture should simply you know adapt to an environment, but rather how the sort of interrelationship which coexists between a human population and the ecosystem. So therefore it tries to you know like bring in a new trends or a new way of approach in looking at the human and environment. Now in their view uh, they tends to see that human beings in a sense constitute uh, another population among our uh, populations of plants and animal species that in a sense uh, interact each other and with the non-living components as well that is the climate, the soil, water and their local ecosystem. So, which rather seems to be much more of a holistic approach in trying to make sense of uh, the relationship between human and its env environment. Now, therefore, from the uh, sort of understanding ecosystem uh, rather than the, the culture constitute the fundamental units of analysis in their conceptual framework of human ecology. So, which means they give a lot of uh, importance to uh, the ecosystem rather than the culture. So, in a sense uh, we can say that uh, they were more attuned to the environmental determinism, uh, deterministic approach. And for them cultural traits are of interest only as they can be shown which again uh, contribute to the population survival in the context of the ecosystem. That again is the environmental possibility. Now, as I said, uh, Roy Rappaport, uh, now moving on to some of the works which this anthropologist has done. Now, Roy Rappaport, uh, as I said, uh, is known for his work on pigs for the ancestor, which was uh, published in 1968. Again, follows this ecosystem based model of human ecology. And here, uh, Rappaport tries to uh, understand and demonstrate how religious rituals, which was practiced by the Sembega tribal group of uh, New Guinea, functioned to maintain their population in balance with the available resources of their environment. That is the balances, that is what in the modern parlance we talk about sustainability. 
that is it is important to you know like looked at the carrying capacity of uh, that resources and perhaps the Sembega community were pretty much uh, able to you know like uh, sustainably use their resources or they were able to sort of balance in terms of through their religious rituals. Now, again uh, Rapapa tends to see religion as something uh, and institutions what Stewart had largely ex excluded from his concept of the ecologically adaptive cultural core. Now, which again plays a key regulatory role in the relationship between Sembega population and the other components of their ecosystem. Now, this is something uh, which Rappaport uh, idea is partly uh, surpassing if not different from Julian Stewart's idea of religion. Now, as I said uh, the Sembaga again were a communities which practices uh, a system of Sweden, Sweden farming that is the slush and bun cultivation which was similar to what uh, was described by Clifford Gritz for the outer islands of Indonesia. Now, if you look at many of the uh, pioneer anthropo anthropologists, they tend to study uh, communities which are in isolation or which rather which can be seen from uh, those who are far from the modernist idea of this civilization. And uh, they tend to you know like uh, give a detailed uh, description of not just their social practices, but their economic practices. And remember when we talk about human and environment relationship, it is important to focus on the economic aspect that is that mode of production, how this mode of production again has uh, an impact on the cultural practices or rather these economic practices over a period of time has become a way of life of that particular community. Now, uh, one the pertinent point uh, or peculiarity of this Sembega community was they were engaged in uh, sort of uh, rearing animals that is domestic animals which were raised by uh, this particular community again is a pig. Now, why is the pig so much important? Uh, is the pig something which is sort of uh, a wealth to them or uh, what, what purpose does it serve? Now, for instance, in the different communities like uh, mostly the tribal communities in Northeast, they again give a lot of uh, importance to owning or rearing uh, the Bose frontalis which is locally known as Mithund. Now, it is not just for their own uh, consumption, uh, but also it serves a purpose in terms of the social and religious practices. And uh, on very important occasions, uh, they tend to slaughter these animals. Now, similarly, uh, the pigs tends to have held a very important position in the context of the Sembaga community and uh, which I will explain here. Now, when we look at the religious practices and how is this religious practices impacting on the environment? There is this sort of interrelationship which goes on in the life of the uh, social cy cycle of the Sembaga community. Now, there is this practices of the great ritual feast wherein uh, a number of uh, pigs are being slaughtered in this occasion and these practices again have often been thought to be an example of maladaptive cultural trait which is sem similar to the sacred cows of India. Now, why is it uh, sometime uh, an observer might tend to see these practices as maladaptive cultural practices because 
at one go n number of animals are being uh, slaughtered. Now, Rappaport has given a different uh, explanation uh, in which he argued that far from being maladaptive uh, practices of this their culture, these ritual regulations of uh, pig killings actually functions to better adapt the Sambaga population to their tropical forest ecosystem. Now, why is it that this is more adaptive rather than maladaptive? Now, Rappaport in his uh, findings from the field asserted that the ritual restrictions of these uh, killings of pigs only on certain ceremonial occasions serve to sort of maximize the supply of protein. Remember, the meat of an animal has sort of uh, catered to the uh, supply of protein to human body and this supply of protein at times when uh, the Sambaga community need the most. And when does these people need? Uh, mostly, they uh, when they go for a war uh, and, and usually in a war people tend to you know like sometimes starve and then they do not have uh, a sufficient supply of uh, you know a food system or which are sort of uh, helpful for the human body. Now, when these warring communities or warring groups come back uh, to their uh, original home habitat, they conduct this kind of ritual so that it sort of uh, uh, supply this particular protein and uh, uh, slaughtering of a number of uh, animals are being carried out. Now, why is this possible again in the Sembega community is because they are small in number and they are able to sort of balance with the uh, kind of resources which are available to them. Now, for instance, uh, the killing of pigs uh, in this community again is also being carried out for certain reasons and one of them is the supernatural regions and uh, which again is to sort of uh, an appeasement uh, practices to those evil spirits which were perhaps seems to be you know uh, a malady or causing uh, certain sickness and diseases and also uh, through this uh, sacrificial practices, it again help the spirits of those ancestors in fighting. And uh, remember, if you look at the tribal warfare, warring groups, they tend to uh, practice different kind of rituals before even setting out for a war, that is seeking the help of their ancestors. So, in a way, this appeasing or sort of uh, giving a reverence to the ancestral spirits enhances uh, these communities in order to you know uh, be more uh, strong if not vigorous when they go to the war front. Now, in a way the slaughtering of this pig if not sacrifice of these uh, pigs serve two purposes that is one appeasing the supernatural forces like the evil spirits and also alongside it tends to uh, you know give a boost to the ancestral spirits in their fight. Now, Rappaport not only see this ritual as serving uh, the nutrients to the Sembaga population, but also it tends to further you know uh, through these ritual cycles it functions to maintain the population density which in a way is compatible to the long term carrying capacity of uh, that particular ecosystem. And this is being practices by regulating uh, 
the frequency of the death of uh, few animals and the intensity which the warfare occurs. So, there is this uh, interrelationship between what is being practices in terms of sacrifice rituals and also in the war front how there has been uh, a sort of a symbolic relationship which exists in these practices. Now, if we are to look at the from the cultural perspective, there are certain rules again which are being followed by the uh, these communities uh, and uh, remember there is a continuous engagement of intertribal warfare and which tends to be part of the uh, tradition of uh, many communities who continuously engage in uh, fighting amongst themselves. And this at this very critical juncture uh, when this war goes on uh, which, which, which was usually carried out for a limited period of time uh, were symbolized by this feast. Now, why is this feast again important? Why is this uh, uh, the killing of uh, pigs if not the feast so symbolic to them? It, it not only uh, to my mind I feel that it, it not only cater to the nutrients or pertains to the uh, warring groups, but also uh, the community feast in a sense has uh, created that uh, togetherness or maybe a sort of uh, cooperations through these kind of practices. Now, they sort of feast together and then uh, sort of share their ideas and uh, a social cohesion is created by these practices. Now, uh, ideally there can be no group which go to the war front, uh, however great the provocation might be until a sufficient herd has been assembled to hold a proper feast. So, in a way to gear up again for the second expedition, this kind of uh, ritual is uh, important and, and, and through this they tend to uh, reinvigorate if not strengthen themselves to move on to uh, go on for the second uh, expedition. Thus, the, the very ability of uh, the Sambaga community to engage in a particular war is also determined by the number of uh, these particular animals which they have produced or they owned. And depending on this, uh, their sort of ability to you know uh, raise the pig again is determined by the overall state of their ecosystem. So, in a way uh, if one is capable of rearing a number of these uh, animals it is a sign of uh, a test of masculinity. Now, the status of uh, an individual is also being seen from uh, owning of the number of animals and then in which they are capable of rearing how much animals uh, they have for this particular feast. Therefore, this sort of economic practices in a way uh, also influence the social or political practices and again it has sort of an overriding uh, implications on the environment when we talk about uh, the adaptive capacity of uh, slaughtering if not rearing animals. And of course, uh, uh, this particular community again uh, uh, apparently are not really concerned with the ecological efficiency and uh, perhaps they engage in slaughtering uh, pigs for religious and social reasons and they tends to uh, not because they are striving to ensure the maximum 
flow protein from the ecosystem to themselves. Now, therefore, it is important to locate and understand how there is uh, social and religious reasons behind these practices. It is not to be seen simply in isolation from the ecological efficiency. There can be sort of uh, an adapt adaptive uh, or maladaptive perspective. Now, in practice, this uh, mass slaughter of uh, pigs at the end of a truce, if not a war, is also symbolizes the kind of wealth and power one has. And remember, uh, the wealth and power of uh, an individual against is counted or measured by the number of animals which they owned and which in a sense also ensured that the support of both the ancestor spirit which in a way uh, helped them in fighting and also their human allies in the next round of fightings which they sort of uh, strengthened themselves and then uh, with these practices they are able to you know like uh, condition themselves or better equip themselves for the other round or next round of uh, expedition. Now, uh, usually uh, these rituals are being uh, attended by uh, big masses and uh, the mass consumption in a way uh, can rather uh, be seen in this particular occasions. Now, from an outsider's perspective, it rather looks to be uh, sort of a wasteful practices and uh, or maybe from a nutritional point of view. However, it tends to serve uh, more of a social needs to this community because uh, it enha enhances in terms of uh, an effective alliances with the needed allies which uh, in a way are coming to or engaging in a war. So, maybe at the times of a truce or uh, is being signed, this sort of uh, feast is uh, pretty much uh, essential for them to uh, and it plays a significant role in terms of enhancing the social cohesion if not uh, alliances within different communities. Now, therefore, uh, ideally it has to the kind of practices has to be seen uh, or located in the context rather than simply the manifest function. It has to be seen from the ideas which are embedded in that practices, the ideas behind these practices. Therefore, the efficacy of the slaughter of uh, these uh, animals should therefore be assessed not as uh, Rappaport has done in terms of the interactions of the Sambaga community with their local ecosystem, but rather it should be seen in terms of their adaptation uh, that is the adaptations of the tribal society to the conflict ridden social environment of the New Zealand highlands. Therefore, these practices serve a dual purposes to them, not just the nutritional uh, supply, but then also uh, in terms of uh, making an alliances, if not uh, a peaceful coexistence of different communities in that area. Now, uh, moving on to the second uh, model of human ecology, which I uh, also popularly known as the actor based uh, model of human ecology. And uh, what, the, what is this actor based model ecology about? It uh, rather tries to uh, develop by Orloff in way back in 1980 and uh, uh, it has become one of the major new wave of, in human ecology. And, uh, what it espouses is that adaptation occurs at the level of individuals rather than on the cultures or populations. 
which again is you know like contradictory to what we had just uh, explained from the Sembaga community, wherein Rappaports give uh, an expi explicit explanation about how the culture in a way uh, determines the human activity in terms of their relationship with the ecology. But actor based model again is pretty much individualistic in that sense, it is different from what we have just discussed. Now, in this uh, model, it reflects that uh, both anthropologists are have a general concern with the individual's decision making processes uh, and uh, which was primarily uh, being initiated by the uh, evolutionary biologists and uh, which also have been carried on with the current preoccupation uh, which shows that the natural selection operates exclusively at the levels of the individual organism. Over here, it is not the uh, other individual which is important, but the individuals in his relationship with his own parts that is the organism. Now, from this perspective, if you look at uh, any levels of organizations, whether uh, it can be in relationship with the communities, the ecosystems or the human social system. It exists only as the fortuitous outcome of interactions among many individual organisms. Therefore, in this model, it is the individual which is given uh, a much much high priority no matter its relationship with any forms of organizations. Now, in the case of human society, therefore, environmental adaptation is often seen as occurring not as a result of natural selection on the cultural or social system level, but rather as the results of the outcomes of thousands of individuals decisions about how best to interact with the environment. Now, which means the individual is not uh, socially or culturally conditioned, but the individual themselves make a decision in order to adapt if not how best to interact with the environment. So, it is not the interest of the society, but the co or the community, but it is in the interest of the uh, individual rather how they tend to function in relation to the environment. Now, over here the individuals assumes uh, to be making choices and um, which is in a sense uh, uh, engaging in by exploiting the available resources while coping with the environmental hazards. Now, for instance, those who make these correct choices will survive and prosper and those who choose less wisely will be selected against. So, in a way in this context we can recall uh, what uh, Charles Darwin talk about in terms of uh, adaptation. Now, when we talk about adaptation, it is also about the choices which uh, we as an individual make. It is not how capable we are, but rather the kind of choices which we make. And if we make the right choices, then the, there are ample chances of uh, or extensive uh, larger chances of being uh, to survive and then prosper. Now, if we give an example of uh, an actor based analysis in the context of the Sembaga community, in the context of that ritual cycle of the pig killing, uh, which was uh, explained uh, explicitly by Rappaport, again, uh, is not something to be seen as an accidental outcome of uh, how an individual make a decision in relationship with his tribesmen. For instance, uh, of how to make a best uh, maximize the use of those limited resources which are available in all uh, within that particular 
society. We can, in a sense, uh, stand the viewpoint, and it has to the community or communitarian ideas. Therefore, we need of this orient societal, if not more of uh, what kind of model in conduct the environment. Next, next.